My name is Virginia Schaefer. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on rectal foreign bodies. I have no disclosures. This is the first report in the modern era of an inserted rectal foreign body. It was published in 1919 in JAMA. The patient, CK, is a 55-year-old male from Indianapolis who presented with a small glass introduced into his rectum 50 hours before. He presented in distress and required a laparotomy. The article describes that it was a struggle to remove even from above due to the wider diameter of the top of the glass. Unfortunately, he died 16 hours later. Foreign bodies in the rectum can be a diagnostic dilemma at times. The patient with an inserted foreign body in the rectum may be embarrassed of his or her situation and thus they may not initially state the reason for seeking medical care. This may also lead to delay in seeking care. Common presenting complaints may be bright red blood per rectum, incontinence, anal pain, abdominal pain, constipation, among others. So a high index of suspicion is necessary. Up to 20% of the time, the patient will not state their true chief complaint. A professional, and non-judgmental attitude must be maintained. In some cases, the foreign body may be due to assault, so great care must be taken in terms of medical and emotional support. And who does this occur? Well, the mean age at presentation is 44 years with a reported age of 20 to over 90 years. It tends to occur more in males ranging from 17 to 37 males to one female. Lake and all reported approximately one case per month in a large urban public hospital, but the true incidence is likely unknown due to underreporting for obvious reasons. What is commonly inserted? Well, household objects make up the majority of the inserted objects. 42.2%, including bottles and glasses, toothbrushes, deodorant bottles, food articles, sports equipment, cell phones, flashlights. Other items um, include wooden rods, broomsticks, knives, sex toys, light bulbs, construction tools, Christmas ornaments, aerosol canisters, cocaine packets, and many others. Here's a plain film. Thoughts on what this could be? Double A battery. Here's another household item. Another household item. Here's this foreign body and a different one. Here a glass similar to the one in the JAMA article from 1919 and a jar. The jar was inserted by a 41 year old man. It was successfully removed under anesthesia using obstetric forceps. The photograph on the right was inserted into an 18 year old male. The object measured over 30 centimeters and the plastic handle was lodged in the rectosigmoid region for a week before the patient presented with only 10 centimeters of its end protruding from the anus. The patient required laparotomy extraction and diversion. Bottle top. Unfortunately, this was a 26-year-old man who had been assaulted. It was removed by Flexig with a net basket under general anesthesia. 
Post removal flexing showed mucosal injuries treated with observation and antibiotics. The patient did well and the assailant was successfully prosecuted. Body packing is when objects, usually drugs, are placed into bodily orifices to transport them or to evade detection. This CT shows a female with drug packets in the vagina, the white arrows, and in the rectum, designated by the black arrows. This is a CT with an apple as the foreign body. Why does this occur? The most common reason for foreign body insertion given is autoeroticism, followed by concealment, also referred to as body packing, attention-seeking behavior or psychiatric disorders, quote-unquote accidental, assault, and to alleviate constipation. And in some cases, we may never know the true reason. Often presentation can be delayed because of patient embarrassment. Again, professionalism is of high importance. The diagnosis should be confirmed by plain film, ideally PA and lateral, because there are instances where a psychiatric patient or a patient for secondary gain will lay on top of an object and claim to have ingested, ingested it or inserted it. A plain film will both confirm the diagnosis and show evidence of free air and perforation, which would accelerate taking the patient to the OR if needed. If the patient has peritonitis or is unstable, no attempts at bedside extraction should be done. The usual resuscitation should be performed in preparation for surgery. Luckily, the majority of patients do not present with peritonitis or free air. Transanal extraction bedside in the ER should be attempted. Local anesthesia with and without conscious sedation uh, should be used. Suprapubic pressure from an assistant may be helpful in preventing proximal migration or in milking the object downward. If manual extraction is not possible, ringed forceps or various grasping forceps can be used in an attempt to extract the object. A Foley catheter passed above the object may help break the vacuum seal and bring the object distal with the inflation of the balloon. A caveat, however, if packets are suspicious for drugs, they should not be removed with forceps as this may precipitate rupture. Endoscopic extraction can be attempted next with the use of a polypectomy snare or forceps. An endoscopic balloon may potentially be passed proximally and inflated in order to retrieve the object. Fluoroscopy can be used in this situation. If this is not successful, then the patient will require general anesthesia. Again, manual extraction should be attempted. A laparoscopic approach may be attempted to milk the object for rectal extraction, but ultimately, a laparotomy may be needed. If transanal extraction is not possible with manual pressure, then a colotomy is needed. This may be necessary for transabdominal removal. If there is a perforation, a Hartman's may be necessary, but if the tissue is good quality, a primary repair is supported in the trauma literature. After extraction, there's a concern for injury. So a period of observation for signs of toxicity are important. Further evaluation with a CT may be needed if ongoing sepsis occurs. Detection of a perforation would require operative intervention. Most authors recommend endoscopic evaluation. However, in published series, it seems this is not always necessary. Evaluation and documentation of sphincter function is important. Many with immediate sphincter dysfunction will improve on their own over time. If there is a significant injury, a sphincter repair may be considered at a later time. This is a large series published by Lake and all. 
87 patients presented with foreign bodies. Two presented with peritonitis that require immediate OR. Of the remaining 85, the ER attempted bedside extraction in 31 and were successful in five. One patient left AMA. So a total of 79 patients presented to the surgical service. 58 were successfully extracted bedside by the surgical team in the emergency room. The rest went to the operating room. Of those, six require laparotomy. In this case series, only eight total laparotomies were required, with the majority being extracted at bedside with IV sedation, plus or minus local, local analgesia. They did find that location of the object in the sigmoid versus the rectum was associated with higher need for laparotomy. In conclusion, initial diagnosis of a rectal foreign body may be difficult, secondary to embarrassment. Plain films help confirm the diagnosis and location of the object, as well as rule out free air. Peritonitis merits a trip to the operating room. In the majority of cases, bedside extraction is highly successful. In the operating room, examiner anesthesia and transanal extraction should be attempted. If that is unsuccessful, laparoscopy or laparotomy with milking the object down for transanal extraction should be attempted. If this is unsuccessful, then colotomy is made for transabdominal extraction within primary repair or resection plus or minus diversion. Thank you very much.